Hello everyone and welcome to another STAT 437 lecture video. In today's video we are going to be talking about marginal models and in particular we're going to be talking about how we can take marginal models, the linear marginal models that we've been talking about in the previous videos, and expand them to accommodate any type of outcome that we might care about. Right, so, so far we've only looked at continuous longitudinal data and we've used uh, the assumption of multivariate normality to fit models to that data. So going forward, what we want to be able to do is take any type of outcome that we could have in our longitudinal data and fit a model to that. So that's what we're going to be sort of discussing today. So I'll open up the slides here. And to begin, we're going to talk a little bit about the shortcomings of marginal linear models or the models that we've been talking about so far. So there are two major shortcomings of what it is that we've been discussing. The first, as I've alluded to, is that we only fit models to linear data or to continuous outcomes, right? And so if you wanted to run a study that looked at a discrete outcome, that looked at count data, that looked at categorical data, none of that is going to be able to be accommodated by the framework that we've been looking at so far. And that's because we've been making this multivariate normality assumption. And the multivariate normality assumption means that uh, the outcomes we're looking at are continuous data between negative infinity and positive infinity. And so if our data don't sort of conform to those standards, then what we've been doing so far is not going to work. The second uh, shortcoming of the linear marginal models that we've been looking at is that we've made strict distributional assumptions, right? So we've been looking at continuous data and maybe you're looking at continuous data in a study you want to analyze. But if those data don't conform to this normality assumption, then what we've talked about so far does not work, right? Because we've assumed normality and then using that assumption of normality, we've talked about how we can accommodate uh, these longitudinal models. But if that normality assumption is violated, then nothing that we've done so far is going to function sort of as we've talked about it. And so those are the two major shortcomings and that's what we wanna overcome with this concept of a generalized marginal model. So if you take a look at this headline, it's you know something of a timely headline, and it's talking about predicting peaks of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, right? And so let's think about really what a scientist or what an epidemiologist would have to do in order to make forecasts of this variety, right? So it's a longitudinal data if you're thinking about, say, forecasting the amount of COVID in a particular region, right? If you treat regions as individuals, then we're looking at longitudinal data, data over time, repeatedly measuring. But if we're trying to forecast the counts of number of cases or number of new cases uh, that are coming in on any particular day, well, that is data that is going to be count data, not continuous data, right? If you're thinking about doing forecasting about, say, the positivity rate of testing for COVID-19, that's also going to be data that's not continuous because there we're sort of looking at this uh, binomial model, right, where we issue a certain number of tests and we want to know how many of those are coming back positive. So that's sort of this binary binomial type data, right? And so right now we're sort of in the midst of, you know, being exposed to uh, forecasts and uh, sort of applied biostatistics more than we've probably ever been. But even though they're working with longitudinal data, the types of models that we've been fitting so far aren't going to be particularly relevant to the individuals working on the forecasts. So that's, I guess, a motivating example to underscore why it's important that we come up with methods that work for data which are non-continuous. So we're going to talk about generalized marginal models for longitudinal data. Now, as the name suggests, they're related to the marginal models that we've been talking about. And as I've been underscoring for the first few minutes of this lecture, the idea with a generalized marginal model is that it's going to be able to accommodate any type of data, right? And so what we did is we took linear regression models, right? And we said, these are roughly speaking what we want to fit when we have continuous longitudinal data. And we expanded them by taking this multivariate normal assumption. Now, if we have other outcomes, we'd want to do sort of a similar task, but we run into this issue. So in the continuous case, normality is an easy assumption to work with because uh, there's the standard normal distribution or the univariate normal distribution. And then we have a multivariate generalization of that. But if you're working with 
count data or you're working with binary data or you're working with categorical data, there's not always going to be a natural multivariate version of the distribution, or at least not one that's nice to work with. And so we can't sort of take this same idea that we were applying where we said, instead of assuming normality, we assume multivariate normality and apply it to all other types of data because for most other types of data, there's not a natural distribution to work from. So what can we do instead? Well, if you think about linear marginal models as being related to linear regression models, right? We also saw generalized linear models. And the whole point of a generalized linear model is that you took the core idea of a linear regression model, which is that we want to relate the mean of a distribution to a linear predictor. And we generalize that to a generalized linear model, which allows for non-continuous data. So our generalized marginal models or generalized linear marginal models are going to be sort of the analog to generalized linear models in the same way that linear marginal models are an analog to linear regression models. So to introduce what a generalized marginal model is, recall that for a linear marginal model, we had to specify a conditional mean, a variance, and pairwise correlations. Okay? So and, and then for a generalized linear model, we need to specify a linear predictor, a link function, and a distribution. Okay, so we're sort of trying to merge these two concepts that we've seen before. And um, how might we go about doing this? Well, what if we specify a linear predictor? So we're going to say eta ij is equal to xij beta. Uh, and we specify some link function. So we say that g of the mean is equal to this linear predictor, right? So this first component here, this linear predictor, is sort of exactly what you would have seen in a generalized linear model. And we're going to use a link function in sort of exactly the same way that you would have in a generalized linear model. But the important bit to realize is that we're doing this uh, for xij. So we're doing this at sort of each individual at each individual time point, right? So each individual is going to have k of these linear predictors, right? And same thing over here, we're looking at the expected value of yij, which is just some univariate value, and we're specifying that to be this linear predictor, but we're going to do that for all i and j. And then, after we've specified our linear predictor, we're going to borrow from the linear marginal models, and we're going to specify a variance structure. So once again, what we'll do is we'll say we'll take phi times by some variance function, and the variance function we're going to allow to be a variance function based on the mean. And that's, again, borrowing from this concept in general generalized linear models, where we know there's this connection between the mean and the variance. So we specified a linear predictor, a variance structure, and we're also going to specify a pairwise correlation matrix. Now, this is exactly what we were doing with linear marginal models, right? And we just say that for any two observations, yij, yil, there's going to be some correlation between them. We can use a pattern matrix for that. We can use an unconstrained matrix for that sort of whatever makes sense for the situation that we're working in, we can specify that matrix and that's going to capture all of our correlation. And now we have sort of a full specification that's a natural extension of a GLM to longitudinal data, right? So in the GLM, we take a link function to link a mean to a linear predictor and then sort of derive the variance based on our distribution. In this situation, what we've done is we've taken a link function to link a mean to a linear predictor. We specified a variance, we specified some correlation. Without assuming any distribution, we sort of have all of the components that we were working with when we were working with linear marginal models. And that's sort of what we're hoping to be able to do in order to specify this generalized marginal model. So take a look at a few quick examples here to underscore all of these points. If we're looking at continuous data, Right, so y, i, j are continuous. Maybe they're not normally distributed, though. Then we can do the uh, the standard thing that we would do with GLMs, which is to consider the identity link function here. Right, so we take the expected values just equal to our linear predictor itself. Maybe we take our variance function to be one, which is what it is when we're looking at normally distributed data. But this works, and so essentially here the idea is that we're assuming some sort of constant variance across all observations. And we could just let an unconstrained correlation matrix here, right? Take the correlation between yij and yil to just be some constant rho jl. And 
it's going to be the same for all individuals. Well, now this has provided essentially the exact same model that we were looking at with a linear marginal model, except we have not made the assumption of normality here, right? Now, it's not entirely clear how we're going to go about fitting this model or whether it's actually going to, to work, but that's sort of the idea is that all of the interesting structure that we care about is captured with this link function, which is the identity link function, this variance function, which is the unit variance function here, and an unconstrained correlation matrix. Now, if we want to look at something that we have not seen before, we could consider some binary data here, right? And so if y, i, j are binary uh, variables, so they're ones or zeros, then we can think about uh, modeling the mean, which is the same as the probability that y, i, j is one. And the obvious thing to do here is to take the x bit function. So if you don't remember, uh, in a logistic distribution, if you invert the, that logistic function, then you get the x bit function. Um, and so we'll be seeing the specific form of this if, if it's not, uh, if you don't remember, that's okay. Well, it'll come up when we're actually working with it. But generally speaking, that's going to allow us to just specify a probability. It's going to output a value between zero and one for a linear predictor. For the variance, well, the variance of a uh, binomial distribution is its mean times by one minus its mean, right? And so we could take uh, the variance function to be pi ij times one minus pi ij or mu ij times one minus mu ij, if you want to use that notation. And again, we could specify an unstructured correlation here. Again, we could use a pattern matrix if we want, but the unstructured works quite well. And so now we have a natural generalization to logistic regression, except we're al allowing these arbitrary correlations between individuals, or sorry, within individuals, not between individuals. If we have count data instead, well, then sort of the natural extension from a GLM is going to be considering a log regression where we're inspired by the Poisson distribution, right? So here we're gonna take the mean to be equal to the exponential of our linear predictor. And that's because in a count regression, we're gonna typically use a log link. And so if you invert that, it's gonna give us the exponential of our predictor. Now in Poisson data, we take the variance function to equal the mean, right? So in here we have uh, v mu ij is equal to this lambda ij, which is the same as mu ij, just sort of interchanging notation. And again, we could specify an unstructured correlation matrix, just allow for arbitrary correlation. So you can see here again, that between the specification of these three traits, that's sort of all of the interesting structure that we care to capture is specified there. And so we're doing that without specifying a specific distribution for y ij, but we're informing our speci specification based on the relevant generalized linear model. So a natural question is, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here saying that we can specify all of this, but do these models actually work? Will they actually, you know, be able to be fit in practice? And so we haven't discussed anything about how to estimate the parameters. Now, what I will say is that we can estimate the parameters. I've been specifying these models in this way for a reason. This is going to be how we go about estimating longitudinal models, but we do need a little bit more theory in order to talk about how we're going to go about estimating it, right? So the sort of giving spoilers for the ending here, we're going to be able to estimate it. They're going to be nicely behaved estimators. They're going to be incredibly flexible. We don't need to specify any distributions, but in order to get from here to there, we're going to need to do a little bit more theory. And in particular, we're going to need to take a look at a topic known as M estimation. And so that's sort of going to be uh, what's coming up in the next lecture. So to give a brief summary, with generalized marginal models, our goal is to extend a generalized linear model to longitudinal data. In order to do this, we're going to specify a linear predictor, a link function, uh, as well as a variance function, and some pairwise associations. And between that specification of those four items, that's going to be all of the structure that we care about in our model. Right? So we're not going to specify a distribution. We're not going to sort of uh, force the data to look any particular way other than by noting what its mean and its variance and its uh, covariance or correlation is. In order to extend a GLM uh, sort of naturally to the case of longi longitudinal data, we can use this. So any sort of pattern uh, that you want to incorporate into the correlation structure, just as we were talking about with linear marginal models, you can accommodate here. And any GLM that you could fit to univariate data, 
or to independent data, you're going to be able to fit to longitudinal data by specifying uh, just these, these patterns, right? So it's gonna take everything that you learned in your GLM course and make it applicable to longitudinal data if you have longitudinal data that look the same as sort of the univariate data that you're used to dealing with. So the question that remains is how do we go about estimating these models, right? And so I'm going to essentially leave this lecture here. Uh, I'll make a couple more points before we go, but that's that's basically where we're leaving off and you know get you thinking about how we might be able to estimate the models. The first point that I wanna make is that I'm going to interchangeably be calling the models that we're using marginal models, uh, generalized linear marginal models, generalized marginal models, all of those are referring to the same situation. If I'm referring to the specific case of a linear marginal model, then I will make note of that specifically because those are a specific type of the models that we're going to be fitting. Um, the next point is that in the next lecture, we're gonna talk about this M estimation. It's going to be a little bit more theoretically dense than what we've been talking about so far, but don't worry too much because the details are being provided more to give you a powerful tool to work forward. And then uh, after that lecture, I'm gonna sort of tie it back into uh, the situation with longitudinal data specifically. And so with that, I think that's essentially everything that I wanted to talk about today. So if you had any questions about these generalized linear marginal models, please let me know, and otherwise I will see you in the next lecture.